powers of the mind. The mind is a reservoir for numerous powers. By utilizing the resources which are hidden within it, one can attain any heights of success in the world. If the mind is trained, made one-pointed and inward, it has the power to penetrate into the deeper levels of our being. It is the finest instrument that a human being can ever have. Lessons on the Sands if you look at someone with full attention by focusing your conscious mind, it can immediately influence him. A Swami taught me this when I was young. His name was Chakravati. He was one of the most eminent mathematicians of India and the author of the book Chakravarti's Mathematics. Later he renounced the world to become a Swami. He was a student of my master. He contended that gaze, or trataka, is a very powerful tool for influencing anything external and strengthening concentration. When the mind is focused externally on some object, it is called gaze. When it is focused internally, it is called concentration. The power of a focused mind is immense. There are various methods of gazing, each of which gives a different power to the human mind. One may gaze at the space between the two eyebrows, the bridge between the two nostrils, a candlelight in a dark room, the early morning sun or the moon. But certain precautions must be observed or one can injure himself both physically and mentally. Thought power is known all over the world. A one-pointed mind can do wonders, but when we direct it toward worldly gains, we are caught in the whirlpool of selfish desires. Many on the path become victims of the temptations of acquiring siddhis, meaning powers, forgetting their real goal of attaining serenity, tranquility and self-realization. One day the Swami said to me, Today I am going to show you something. Go to the court and find a person who is being persecuted unjustly. So I asked one of the lawyers, Can you tell me of anyone who is being tried unjustly in this court? He said, Yes, I have such a case. I went back and the Swamiji said, Okay, this man will be acquitted. And I will now tell you word for word the judgment that will be handed down. He dictated the judgment to me, although he was not a lawyer. He said, I have made three mistakes purposefully. The judgment will be exactly like my dictation, and it will also have these three mistakes. I typed up his dictation. When the judgment was later handed down, Every word, comma, and period was exactly the same as what he had dictated to me. He said, compare my dictation with the judgment and you will find that the same two commas and one period are missing. The dictation perfectly matched the judgment. I said, Swamiji, you can change the course of the world. He said, I do not claim to do that. That is not my purpose. I am demonstrating this so that you can understand how a man can influence the mind of another from any part of the world, if it is for a good reason. Helping others is possible from a distance. I asked him to give me the secret of this power. He said, I will give you the secret, but you won't want to practice it. I did practice the method for some time and it helped me, but later I discontinued it because it was distracting and time-consuming. The Swami was very kind and also taught me philosophy through mathematics. Every digit was explained with verses from the Upanishads. From zero to one hundred, 
he explained the philosophical meaning of the science of mathematics. Mathematics has the digit 1. All other digits are multiples of the same 1. Similarly, there is only one absolute reality, and all the names and forms of the universe are multiple manifestations of that one. Drawing lines on the sand of the Ganges with his staff, he made a triangle and taught me how life should be an equilateral triangle. The angle of the body, the angle of internal states, and the angle of the external world make up the equilateral triangle of life. All the numbers are the outcome of a point which cannot be measured. Similarly, this whole universe has come out of an unmeasurable void. Life is like a wheel, which he compared with the circle or zero. This circle is an expansion of the point he used another analogy. There are two points, called death and birth, and life here is a line between the two. The unknown path of life is an infinite line. My repulsion toward the study of mathematics was dispelled. After that, I began studying mathematics with considerable interest. I learned that mathematics is a positive science which is the very basis of all sciences, but it is itself based on the exact science of Sankhya's philosophy. Sankhya's philosophy is the most ancient philosophy for knowing the body, its components and various functions of the mind. Yoga is a practical science which leads one to the superconscious state. Through understanding Sankhya, all philosophical questions arising in my mind were solved easily, and then I understood the scriptures properly. The last day of his teaching was enchanting. He said, Now make a zero first, then put one afterward. Zero, one. Every zero has value if the one is put first. But zero has no value if the one is not put first. All the things of the world are like zeros, and without them being conscious of the one reality, they have no value at all. When we remember the one reality, then life becomes worthwhile. Otherwise it is burdensome. The Swami left for the deep Himalayas, and I never met him again. I am grateful to those teachers who spent their valuable time in teaching me. Transmutation of Matter In 1942, I started on a journey to Badrinath, the famous Himalayan shrine. On the way, there is a place called Srinagar, which is situated on the bank of the Ganges. Five miles from Srinagar, there is a small Shakti temple, and just two miles below that was the cave of an Aghori Baba. Aghor is a very mysterious study, which is rarely mentioned in books and hardly understood even by the yogis and swamis of India. It is an esoteric path involving solar science and is used for healing. This science is devoted to understanding and mastering the finer forces of life, finer than prana. It creates a bridge between life here and hereafter. There are very few yogis who practice the Aghori science, and those who do are shunned by most people because of their strange ways. The villagers in the area around Srinagar are very much afraid of the Aghori Baba. They never went near him, because whenever anyone approached him in the past, he called them names and threw pebbles at them. He was about six feet five inches tall and very strongly built. He was about seventy-five years of age. He had long hair and a beard and wore a loincloth made of jute. He had nothing in his cave except a few pieces of gunny sack. 
I went to see him, thinking that I would pass the night there and learn something from him. I asked a local pundit to show me the way. The pundit said, This Aghori is no sage. He is dirty. You don't want to see him. But the pundit knew much about my master and me, and I persuaded him to take me to the Baba's cave. We arrived in the evening just before dark. We found the Aghori sitting on a rock between the Ganges and his cave. He asked us to sit beside him. Then he confronted the pundit, saying, Behind my back you call me names, and yet you greet me with folded hands? The pundit wanted to leave, but the Aghori said, No! Go to the river and fetch me a pot of water. When the frightened pundit came back with water, the Aghori handed him a cleaver and said, There is a dead body which is floating in the river. Pull it ashore, chop off the thigh and calf muscles, and bring a few pounds of the flesh to me. The Aghori's demand shook the pundit. He became very nervous, and so did I. He was extremely frightened and did not want to carry out the Aghori's wishes. But the Aghori became fierce and shouted at him, saying, Either you will bring the flesh from that dead body, or I will chop you and take your flesh. Which do you prefer? The poor pundit, out of deep anxiety and fear, went to the dead body and started cutting it up. He was so upset that he also accidentally cut the first and second fingers of his left hand, and they started bleeding profusely. He brought the flesh to the Baba. Neither the pundit nor I were then in our normal senses. When the pundit came near, the Aghori touched the cuts on his fingers, and they were healed instantly. There was not even a scar. The Aghori ordered him to put the pieces of flesh into an earthen pot, to put the pot on the fire, and to cover the lid with a stone. He said, Don't you know this young Swami is hungry? And you also have to eat. We both said, Sir, we are vegetarians. The Baba was irritated by this, and said to me, Do you think I eat meat? Do you agree with the people here that I am dirty? I too am a pure vegetarian. After ten minutes had passed, he told the pundit to bring him the earthen pot. He gathered a few large leaves and said, Spread these on the ground to serve the food on. The pundit, with trembling hands, did so. Then the Aghori went inside the cave to fetch three earthen bowls. While he was gone, the pundit whispered to me, I, I don't think I will live through this. This is against everything that I have learned and practiced all my life. I should commit suicide. What have you done to me? Why did you bring me here? I said, Be quiet. We cannot escape, so let us at least see what happens. The Aghori ordered the pundit to serve the food. When the pundit took the lid off the pot and began filling my bowl, we were astonished to find a sweet called rasgula, which is made from cheese and sugar. This was my favorite dish, and I had been thinking of it as I was walking to the Baba's cave. I thought it was all very strange. The Aghori said, This sweet has no meat in it. I ate the sweet, and the pundit had to eat it too. It was very delicious. What was left over was given to the pundit to distribute among the villagers. This was done to prove that we had not been fooled by means of a hypnotic technique. All alone in the darkness, the pundit left for his village, which was three miles away from the cave. I preferred to stay with the Aghori to solve the mystery of how the food was transformed and to understand his bewildering way of living. Why was the flesh of a dead body cooked 
and how could it turn into sweets? Why does he live here all alone, I wondered. I had heard about such people, but this was my first chance to meet one in person. After I meditated for two hours, we began talking about the scriptures. He was extraordinarily intelligent and well-read. His Sanskrit, however, was so terse and tough that each time he spoke, it took a few minutes to decipher what he was saying before I could actually answer him. He was no doubt a very learned man, but his way was very different from other sadhus that I had ever met. A gore is a path which has been described in the Atharva Veda, but in none of the scriptures have I ever read that human flesh should be eaten. I asked him, why do you live like this, eating the flesh of dead bodies? He replied, why do you call it a dead body? It is no longer human, it's just matter, and it is not being used. You're associating it with human beings. No one else will use that body, so I will. I'm a scientist doing experiments, trying to discover the underlying principles of matter and energy. I'm changing one form of matter to another form of matter. My teacher is Mother Nature. She makes many forms, and I am only following her law to change the forms around me. I did this for that pundit so that he would warn others to stay away. This is my thirteenth year at this cave, and no one has visited me. People are afraid of me because of my appearance. They think I am dirty and that I live on flesh and dead bodies. I throw pebbles, but I never hit anybody. His external behavior was very crude, but he told me that he was behaving that way knowingly, so that no one would disturb him as he studied and so that he would not become dependent on the villagers for food and other necessities. He was not imbalanced, but to avoid people he behaved as though he were. His way of living was totally self-dependent, and although he continued to live in that cave for twenty-one years, no villager ever visited him. We stayed up through the night, and he instructed me, talking the entire time about the Aghor path. This path was not for me, but I was curious to know why he lived such a lifestyle and did all that he was doing. He had the power to transform matter into different forms, like changing a rock into a sugar cube. One after another, the next morning, he did many such things. He told me to touch the sand and the grains of sand turned into almonds and cashews. I had heard of this science before, and I knew its basic principles, but I had hardly believed such stories. I did not explore this field, but I am fully acquainted with the governing laws of the science. At noon, the Aghori insisted that I eat something before leaving. This time he took out a different sweet from the same earthen jar. He was very gentle with me, all the time discussing the Tantra scriptures. He said, This science is dying. Learned people do not want to practice it. So there will be a time when this knowledge will be forgotten. I asked, What is the use of doing all this? He said, what do you mean by use? This is a science, and I am a scientist of this knowledge and should use it for healing purposes, and should tell other scientists that matter can be changed into energy, and energy into matter. The law that governs matter and energy is one and the same. Beneath all names and forms, there lies one unifying principle which is still not known in its entirety by modern scientists. Vedanta and the ancient sciences describe this underlying principle of life. There is only one life force, 
and all the forms and names in this universe are but varieties of that one. It is not difficult to understand the relationship between two forms of matter, because the source is one and the same. When water becomes solid, it is called ice. When it starts evaporating, it is called vapor. Young children do not know that these three forms are the same matter, and that essentially there is no difference in their composition. The difference is only in the form it takes. The scientists today are like children. They do not realize the unity behind all matter, nor the principles for changing it from one form to another. Intellectually, I agreed with him, and yet I did not approve of this way of living. I said goodbye and promised to visit him again, but I never have. I was curious about the fate of the pundit who had gone to his village the previous night in a state of fear, so I went to see him again. To my surprise, he was completely changed and was thinking of following the Aghori and becoming his disciple. Where is my donkey? When I stayed in Mao, a small city in Uttar Pradesh, I lived in a small hut which was built for wandering swamis and sadhus. Most of the time I stayed in my room, doing my exercises and sitting in meditation. I came out just for a short while in the morning and evening. A laundry man used to wash clothes nearby. He had no wife and children, only a donkey. One day he lost his donkey. He was so worried that he became stunned and went into a trance. People thought he was in Samadhi. In India, people will do anything in the name of Samadhi. They will even sell their homes and offer money to that person who has apparently attained that state. They believe that giving gifts is the way to express their love and devotion for a holy man. The laundry man sat in one position for two days and people started placing money, flowers and fruit all around him. Two people declared themselves his disciples and began collecting the money. But that laundry man did not stir. His followers began encouraging others to come. They wanted everyone to know that they were the disciples of this great guru. Through word of mouth, he soon became famous. I received information through one of his disciples that there was a great man in Samadhi near the place where I was staying. I went to see him. There was indeed someone sitting very still with his eyes closed. Many people were sitting around him chanting, Oh Lord, bring him back. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna. I asked them, what are you doing? They said, he is our guru and he is in Samadhi. I became curious and thought, let me see what happens when he comes out of this state. After two days, he opened his eyes. Everyone looked on expectingly to hear what profound sermon he would deliver. And when he came out of the trance, he only said, Where is my donkey? The desire with which one goes into meditation is a prime factor. When a fool goes into sleep, he comes out as a fool. But if one does meditation with a single desire for enlightenment, he comes out as a sage. There is a fine distinction between the person who becomes preoccupied and pensive and the aspirant who really meditates. Intense worry can drive the mind towards one-pointedness, but in a negative way. Through meditation, the mind becomes positive, one-pointed and inward. The outer signs and symptoms are similar. Worry makes the body inert and tense, while meditation makes it relaxed, steady and still. For meditation, purification of the mind is essential. 
for worry it is not needed. When intense worry controls the mind, the mind becomes inert and insensitive. But if a great man contemplates on the miseries of the world, it is not a worry at all, but a loving and selfless concern for humanity. In this state, the individual mind expands and unites itself with the cosmic one. When the mind is engrossed in individual interests, one-pointedly, it is called worry. When the mind is made aware of the misery of others, it starts contemplating positively. In both cases, mind can become one-pointed, but in the latter case, consciousness is expanded. When John was put in an isolated cell on the island of Patmos, he worried because he thought that the message of his master would not reach the masses. But actually, this sort of worry was not for the fulfillment of his own desires. It was a universal issue on which he contemplated and meditated. Meditation is expansion and worry is contraction. The same power that can flow toward negative grooves can also voluntarily be directed toward positive grooves. Therefore, it is important for a student to purify the mind first and then to meditate. Without a disciplined and purified mind, meditation cannot become helpful in the path of enlightenment. Preparation is important. The preliminary steps, control of actions, speech, dietary habits and other appetites are essential requisites in preparation. Those who discipline themselves and then meditate receive valid experiences. They come in touch with their positive and powerful potentials. These experiences become guides in fathoming the deeper levels of consciousness. The untrained and impure mind cannot create anything worthwhile. But the meditative and contemplative mind is always creative. Both worry and meditation leave their deeper imprint on the unconscious mind. Worry creates several psychosomatic diseases, while meditation makes one aware of other dimensions of consciousness. If the aspirant knows how to meditate, he will naturally be free from his worrying habits. Hatred and worry are two negative powers which control the mind. Meditation and contemplation expand the mind. I concluded that the poor laundryman, though sitting still, was deeply engrossed in misery. He was in deep sorrow and his mind lost its balance. In that state he became still without knowing where he was. In Samadhi, the mind is consciously led to higher dimensions of awareness. The aspirants who try to attain Samadhi without purification of mind are disappointed because such an impure mind creates obstacles in attaining this state. Samadhi is the result of a conscious and controlled effort. It is a state of transcendent consciousness. Worry contracts the mind while meditation expands it. Expansion of individual consciousness and union with the transcendent consciousness is called Samadhi. Who was that other Gopinath? I was staying on the other side of the Ganges, six miles from the city of Kanpur. I lived in a garden by the bank of the river. During those days, I didn't care for anything of the world. I never went to the city, but many people wanted to see me. They would come with fruit and sit before me. In order to avoid that, I used to keep some malas, and when anyone came, I would say, first sit down and repeat this mantra two thousand times, and then we will talk. Most of my visitors would leave the malas and quietly depart. There was a man called Gopinath who was treasurer of the Reserve Bank of India at Kanpur. He came with four people one afternoon. 
they sat down and started chanting. They became so engrossed in chanting that the time slipped by unnoticed. At nine o'clock in the evening, he suddenly opened his eyes and said, Something very terrible has happened. Everyone asked, What is it? He said, My niece was to get married at seven o'clock tonight. All the ornaments for the marriage ceremony are locked in my safe, and I have the only key with me here. Swamiji, what have you done to me? I replied, I haven't done anything. The atmosphere here does that to you. It happens to everyone who comes here. You relax and forget the world's problems. You experience and enjoy divinity. Why are you so worried? But the ornaments and jewelry which I have to give them are in my safe. I said, Look, did you really forget yourself in chanting today? He said, That's why I'm still here. Then don't worry, God will take care of the situation. If something bad can happen because of chanting the Lord's name, let it happen. Something worse would happen without it. They got into their horse cart and quickly returned to the city. When he arrived, he anxiously asked what had happened. The people there were confused by his concern. They said, what is the matter with you? The ceremony is over. Everything is fine. He said, I was on the other side of the Ganges and had my keys with me. What about the ornaments? They said, You gave the ornaments. Have you lost your memory? His wife came and said, You presented the ornaments ten minutes before the ceremony. Now the marriage party is over and everyone is taking its food. But the four people who were with him confirmed that he was with me, chanting. They said, Either you are fools, or we are fools. They were quite disturbed because they could not reconcile the reports with their own memories. Gopinath completely lost his mental equilibrium. He said, I am Gopinath, but who was that Gopinath who came here? When he went to the office the next day, he wouldn't talk to anyone except to ask one question. He would say, I am only one Gopinath. Can you tell me who that was? For three years he was obsessed. He had to resign from his job because of it. His wife came to see me, but I could not help. I asked, Does he speak with you? She said, Yes. But all the time he asks, Tell me, honey, who was that other Gopinath? Did he look exactly like me? After this incident, many people came running to me saying, You are a sage of great miracles. I said, You are praising me for nothing. Neither I nor they knew what had happened, and really I did not know how it had happened. Later I asked my master, What was it? My master said that he was fully aware of this fact, and that it was possible that one of the sages from our tradition helped Gopinath because he was fully absorbed in chanting God's name. Throughout my life it has been my personal experience that sages are kind and generous in guiding and protecting the devotees of God. As far as my experiences go, a sage can live in the Himalayas yet can travel and project himself in any part of the world. An Experience with a Psychic On our way to Rishikesh in 1973, we stayed in one of the hotels at New Delhi. There I met Dr. Rudolf Ballantyne, a psychiatrist and former professor of a medical school in the United States he had recently come from touring the countries of the Middle East via Pakistan. Dr. Ballantyne was telling me about an experience he had at Konagat Place, which is a famous shopping center at New Delhi. 
A stranger had called him by name and then abruptly told him the name of his girlfriend in England. The doctor asked, How do you know these things? He said, You were born on such and such date and your grandfather's name is such and such. Then the man told him something very personal which no one except Dr. Ballantyne knew. The doctor thought, this is the person for whom I have come to India. The man said, Sir, give me five dollars. And the doctor obliged. The man was looking here and there because he was afraid the police might see him. If the police had known what he was about, they would have arrested him. He said, Stay here, I will come right back. The doctor waited for half an hour, but the man did not return. Dr. Ballantyne told me, Swamiji was a great man. I asked, What did he do? He answered, He told me all those personal things about myself, although I was a complete stranger. I replied, Didn't you already know those things? Yes. Then, what big thing did he do? If somebody knows what you are thinking, then you obviously already know it, too. This knowledge doesn't approve you in any way. This ability may amaze you for some time, but it cannot help anyone in self-growth. Fakes, like the one Dr. Ballantyne encountered, are often found disguised as sadhus at Conigate Place telling about someone's past and predicting the future. They learn such tricks just to make their living. Naive tourists mistake them for great sages. Such tourists never reach the places where the real sages are. These pretenders give a bad name to spirituality and to spiritual people. Dr. Ballantyne then started traveling with us when we left India, he stayed at Rishikesh and in other parts of India for several months, visiting the schools of Indian medicine. He returned through the United States to join us, and he is now conducting and directing the Institute's Combined Therapy Program.